Part 12 is here I hope you enjoy. Chapter 25. Deadly Training. So you celebrated Memorial Day together with Penemu, huh? Tanin commented, looking at a happy Issei. I'm glad you were able to distract yourself a bit these days. The dragon, who was now in his human form, eyed the gauntlet. Did you have fun too, Diedrake? He asked, a smirk on his face. You know very well that I don't have time for that kind of thing. I was just sleeping all day. The dragon commented matter-of-factly, making a nervous bead of sweat decorate the head of its bearer. Does that mean that sleeping all day is some kind of job? Asked the chestnut. By the way, where is Tiamat? Issei deflected the topic, making Tannen slightly serious. She wanted to talk a thing or two with Penemu. Let's just say, she's not in a very good mood. She commented the dragon, wondering if he should be the one to tell her about the training, or leave it to Penemu. Hum, that could be a problem, the brunette commented with slight concern. Don't worry, Tannen declared instantly, I don't think it's so serious that he's going to kill her, she commented, so that then a small drop of sweat could be seen on her face. Believe, thanks for not worrying me, she exclaimed the brunette in a sarcastic way with her eyes rolled back. In the same forest, next to the stream, Tiamat grabbed Penemu by the neck and yanked her hard against a tree, lifting her into the air as she glared at her with palpable fury in her eyes. Did you think I would agree to a plan that would risk Issei's life? She hissed with slight venom in her voice. Have you gone crazy? Penemu just looked at her without flinching, despite the fact that she was practically being choked. It's crazy to think that Issei can become very strong in just one month to be able to face Hakuryuko. Hearing this, Tiamat couldn't help but raise an eyebrow. I know very well his power, and also his ambitions. Now that he knows about Issei's existence, it won't be long before he comes to face him. The fall narrowed his eyes. And you know very well that he won't want you to save his hide forever. Penemu finally closed her eyes calmly. If it was a month of fairly conventional training, Issei wouldn't achieve anything. What do you want to get at with all this talk? Tiamat asked, beginning to grow impatient. Penemu opened her eyes, and a sparkle graced her gaze. What I mean is that you are too soft. Tiamat could not help looking at her with great surprise at her words. Finally, Penemu ended up giving a small sigh, at the same time that she softened her gaze. Listen to me well, I also appreciate Issei very much. That's why I know that the best for him will not be achieved overnight, but at least we can make the process faster if we use extreme methods. Penemu closed her eyes deeply, at the same time that his voice cracked slightly. I'll say it again, I don't want to hurt you, and I don't want you to hurt yourself. But this is the only way. Tiamat was never a woman to be carried away by the words of others, but she had to say that on this occasion she was genuinely impressed. After a few seconds of pondering, the dragon finally let go of the fallen's neck, causing the fallen to stare at her intently. Tiamat shared his gaze, causing a few seconds of silence graced by the noise of the stream to fill the air. Do you promise that nothing bad will happen to him? Tiamat's question caused Penemu to stare into her eyes. I can promise you that he won't die. She responded, causing the dragon to share her gaze. Finally, Tiamat gave a small sigh then created a magic circle and took out her celestial sword, then threw it at Penemu. The fallen caught the sword in mild astonishment at the dragon's attitude. Very good, I trust you, Tiamat, commented, leaning against a tree as he crossed his arms. Besides, I think you're also right about Issei's future. The dragon couldn't help but look at the sky with a very worried look. Most likely, many dangers await her, Tiamat looked down from her remembering something Penemu had said. By the way, you said you really cared for Issei, she commented, then narrowed her eyes slightly in suspicion. What happened in these last days? Penemu couldn't help but avert her gaze for a second, causing Tiamat to narrow her eyes even more. Finally, La Cadre sighed in defeat. To be honest, you're not the only one who has feelings for Issei anymore. She commented, making Tiamat's eyes widen at the answer. He was so stubborn, and also so loving, a small smile appeared on her face after remembering. I just couldn't help it. For every word he said to me, I felt like my whole body was slowly going crazy. It was a very strange feeling, but very nice at the same time. A small blush appeared on Penemu's face, and then she lowered her head as she clasped her hands. 
I do not know how to explain it. It was just a unique feeling. Tiamat finished her sentence, causing the cadre to look at her in surprise. At least it didn't take you so long to accept it. She commented the dragon with a small smile on her face. You are not angry. Penemu couldn't help but ask, since the dragon's carefree attitude didn't match her character at all. Annoyed, Tiamat couldn't help but blink a few times. Why would she be angry? Well, it's quite simple, Penemu commented, rubbing her hair. After all, I just said that we are in love with the same man. Oh, I get it, Tiamat commented, then looked up at the sky with a small smile. I think in a small part, that reaction is because polygamy is not frowned upon among dragons. His smile turned into a serious look, at the same time that his eyes reflected some pain. Although, as I said, it would only be a small part of the cause. Hearing this, Penemu couldn't help but look at her with even more attention. Tiamat lowered her gaze, closing her eyes as she considered whether or not she should tell him. Finally, she opened her eyes, giving him such an intimacy through her gaze that it was able to make even Penemu tense up a bit. I don't want to tell anyone else about this, and I don't like to talk about it either. But, Tiamat's gaze softened, giving him a small smile. I think you should know. After all, I've considered you as my friend for a while now. This made Penemu's eyes widen at the confidence the dragon showed towards her. Before you continue, I want to promise you something else. Hearing Penemu's proposal, Tiamat couldn't help but look at her with quite a bit of intrigue. I promise you won't regret opening up to me, friend. She promised her, outlining a smile. Tiamat was a little surprised at his words, though she was quick to return that smile. I must admit that that makes me calmer. The dragon commented, before becoming a little serious. Our species does not get carried away by its feelings as if nothing had happened. The reality is that our species is very different from the others, since we have the capacity to feel ten times more than what you feel. Tiamat looked up from her, watching as the clouds moved. That means that if we feel happiness, we feel it ten times more. If we feel hate, we feel it ten times more, and, if we feel sadness, we feel it ten times more, Penemu could notice how she paused a little at the last, indicating that it was the delicate point. Far from helping dragons, this trait is considered their only weakness. Hate clouds the mind of any dragon, causing them to become completely irrational on most occasions. Even I had been completely consumed by this. Feeling before I meeting Issei, Tiamat lowered her gaze, staring at her. But before that, there was another emotion that completely consumed me, sadness. Tiamat lightly clenched her fists after saying the word. That is, without a doubt, the worst negative emotion that a dragon can have. Thanks to her, that ambiguous ending that you use arises. Dragons fall. Penemu commented, receiving a nod from Tiamat. Everyone knows that I suffered the fall of the dragon, and thanks to Diedrag I was able to recover before I died. But what they don't know is that the traumas caused by this mental illness never disappear. Hearing this, Penemu couldn't avoid looking at Tiamat with great empathy. The fall of the dragon has only left me insecure, and when Diedrag left, that insecurity turned into hate. And when I met Issei, Tiamat looked down from her sadly. That hate turned into fear. Fear. Penemu couldn't help but raise an eyebrow at the latter. But, it's illogical for a woman as beautiful as you to be afraid of having a relationship with Issei. Yes I am so beautiful, why did they two leave me? Tiamat yelled, making Penemu shocked immensely after the outburst from him. If I confess to Issei, I'm afraid, I'm afraid he won't love me like that. Tiamat finally looked up from him, giving a small sigh. That's why I prefer things to stay that way. I'm really happy with him the way things are now. Also, it makes me really happy to see that he's progressing, and he's always smiling. Tiamat put a hand to his chest, looking at Penemu with great seriousness. That's why, that's why I'm even willing to find a woman who's worth it and makes him happy, and who manages to heal his heart. I'm not going to be selfish if I don't even dare to confess. I just want him to be happy, because I know that if he is happy, Penemu couldn't help but put both hands on her hip. Would you really feel happy that way? She asked herself, raising an eyebrow. Tiamat merely sneered, then smiled. I'm not an idiot. I know that seeing her with another woman and not being with me would really affect me. A very serious look would adorn the look of the dragon. 
But I'm not one to decide the happiness of others. He taught me very well. I'm not going to be selfish again because of a simple whim of mine. Especially if I really love him, and I do. That's why I want what better for him, even though I'm not the one by his side. Penemu couldn't help looking at her with great astonishment, and then closing her eyes with a smile. You are truly admirable. Penemu stared at her, pointing to herself. But, I want you to know that I will not be that woman who will be next to her. Hearing this, Tiamat couldn't help but look at her in great confusion. Because, the dragon asked, unable to understand her. Penemu turned away, frowning slowly. A couple of images covered in blood and different screams hit her mind, and at the end of all of them Ludmil appeared. I'm not afraid to confess, or anything like that. Penemu clenched her fists tightly, then lowered her gaze. But, I don't deserve to love, much less deserve to be loved, after all the atrocities I've done throughout my life as a fallen. Penemu turned around, giving the dragon a very determined look. That is why I will also help you in that search in any way I can. A small smile appeared on her face. After all, I love him very much too, and that's why I want to see that ghost from his past disappear once and for all. The fallen held up her hand, flashing a small smile. Tiamat hugged her almost instantly, returning her smile. By the way, do you already know where to start? Penemu asked, flashing a somewhat competitive smile. I've been researching these days. Human women are not an option because of their short lifespan. What has been very interesting is about the Valkyries. They are looking for a husband until before they turn 25 physically. Perhaps one of her could be the right one. Obviously that doesn't mean we should force the issue. We just have to have an idea of which women might really want him. Remember that he is the Red Dragon Emperor, and that attracts a lot of larva. Tiamat looked up from him, thinking carefully. Gabriel, the future queen of the Valkyries, Ayaka, they are all quite respectable women, and I think they would really be in love with Issei if they tried to get close to him for that purpose. Like Rias Gramori and her maids. Penemu's question caused a bored look to grace the dragon's face. No, not those brats. Tiamat made his opinion very clear, indicating that they should protect Issei's safety against that type of women, just in case. A few minutes later, the nerves of the two men dissipated when they saw the two women arrive. Issei. Tiamat rushed towards him to enclose him in a bear hug. I missed you a lot. The dragon exclaimed, while she rubbed her cheek against Issei's with great joy making the brown-haired man slightly confused, although she did not hesitate to answer the hug. Issei looked at Tannen with a face that said, wasn't she upset? Tannen just shrugged, indicating that he had no idea what had happened. Penemu landed next to the dragon, making one of her robes appear through a magical circle. We have Tiamat's sword and costume. Everything is ready to start tomorrow. Hearing this, the atmosphere became somewhat tense. Even Tiamat stopped rubbing his cheek against Issei's. The brunette didn't understand what was happening, although Penemu quickly explained it to him. For tomorrow, you will have to use this tunic and this sword for your training. There will be a total of 800 repetitions of different exercises, which will increase in difficulty as you overcome them. The only one that will not change and will have a higher number will be the sword with a total of 2000 daily repetitions. T2000 Issei couldn't help but think in complete disbelief. But he quickly calmed down, after remembering that when he could barely lift Tiamat's sword, he still couldn't even awaken Balance Breaker from it. To finish, you will have a little training with Tannen. The Fallen looked at the dragon. We have not yet agreed on what it will be, but by tomorrow everything will be ready. Penemu looked seriously at the brunette. Make sure you enjoy this day. Issei quickly nodded, then sat next to Tiamat while they began to talk about what the brunette had done to Grigori. The dragon had to admit that she was a little envious, but even so she couldn't help but feel happy for both of them. And so the hours went by, where Tiamat finally detached herself from Issei to go take a bath at the Hyodo residence, while Penemu had been working all afternoon, until she disappeared to take a bath in the stream. Therefore, Tanan and Issei were left alone. I must admit that you have made good progress despite being a devil reincarnated, Sekiryote. Issei frowned slightly at the nickname, though he quickly brushed it off. Now that I wonder, why are reincarnated devils called that way? Hearing the question, Tannen couldn't help but look at him in slight astonishment. I must admit that is a good question. 
she commented, giving him a small smile as she rested her hand on her chin. It's not that devils say it in a racist way to those humans turned devils. It's that there really is a big difference between them. Hearing this, Issei paid special attention to it. A reincarnated demon is recognized as such, since he returns from the dead carrying a demonic body, but his soul is still human. Tannen made a small drawing on the floor of a fallen angel and other images that he did not understand. Any race can transform into a reincarnated devil. But if you are a fallen angel, your soul will still be that of a fallen angel. If you are a dragon, your soul will still be that of a dragon. Tannen waved her hand, indicating that the list went on and on. What really lies in how powerful a reincarnated devil is is not its container, but its contents. As is the case with humans with sacred gears, or any other entity that has a soul equivalent to or greater than that of a demon. Finally, Tannen made a drawing on the back, making Issei look at it intently. But where do these souls originate from? The only thing we know is that they are generated just like a star, everything comes through energy, and this energy is transformed into power. The souls of the dragon gods are the most powerful, and at the same time, the most dangerous. As is the case with humans with sacred gears, or any other entity that has a soul equal to or greater than that of a demon. Finally, Tannen drew a picture on the back, causing Issei to look at him intently. But where do these souls originate? The only thing we know is that they are generated just like a star, everything comes through energy, and this energy is transformed into power. The souls of the dragon gods are the most powerful, and at the same time, the most dangerous. As is the case with humans with sacred gears, or any other entity that has a soul equal to or greater than that of a demon. Finally, Tannen drew a picture on the back, causing Issei to look at him intently. But where do these souls originate? The only thing we know is that they are generated just like a star, everything comes through energy, and this energy is transformed into power. The souls of the dragon gods are the most powerful, and at the same time, the most dangerous. Everything comes through energy, and this energy is transformed into power. The souls of the dragon gods are the most powerful, and at the same time, the most dangerous. Everything comes through energy, and this energy is transformed into power. The souls of the dragon gods are the most powerful, and at the same time, the most dangerous. Wait, Issei cut him off, making the dragon stare at him. Then who was it that concentrated such an enormous amount of power to create those kinds of souls? Well, Tannen rubbed at her hair, thinking hard. Dias created humans and angels, which now you can also know as devils and fallen angels. That only makes us think that someone created Red, who was the first supernatural being to exist in this world. Tannen finally gave a small sigh, then stared at him. Even so, we are the same as humans in the matter of finding the origin of everything. We simply cannot find that answer and it is even more likely that this entity is still generating very powerful souls today, but in other worlds. Tannen finally erased all the drawings, throwing the stick away. The universe is infinite, and that makes our questions also infinite. Therefore, it will be impossible to find a clear answer to our origin. We can only thank our creator for letting us exist. Issei ruffled his hair. How complicated! He exclaimed the brunette, making Tannen laugh out loud. Then how is it that souls are generated when procreating? That's another one of the things you don't have answers to. Was Tannen's simple answer. We simply believe that the substance of those two souls come together to create a new one. Although it is only a mere assumption. The dragon's gaze hardened a bit after remembering one thing. After all, there have been some exceptions to that rule throughout history. Like, for example, humans with the souls of supernatural beings. Line jump. They are all ready, Penemu asked Tannen and Tiamat, receiving a nod from both. Issei just looked at them strangely. Why do they have to be prepared? I won't always be there for work reasons. They will make sure nothing goes wrong during your training. Upon hearing the answer, the brown-haired man couldn't help but think that perhaps Penemu was exaggerating a bit. Put it on, he commented she, tossing the robe into her hands. Seeing this, Issei quickly activated his balance breaker and grabbed it with both of his hands, causing a small crater to rise up at his feet. It's heavy, but not as heavy as I thought, Issei thought, as he put it on. Before we begin, I must warn you that there are two rules. She commented the cadre, jabbing Tiamat's sword into the ground. The first, is that you can't use any kind of magic. 
Issei just nodded, not seeing much of a problem with the matter. A somewhat tense atmosphere arose when Penemu narrowed her eyes. The second, is that you can't use your sacred gear at any time. Hearing this, Issei could feel how everything around him turned black. Had I heard correctly, if he wasn't wearing the armor, there was no way he could stand upright with that robe on. An awkward silence fell between the two, which was broken by Penemu when she raised an eyebrow. Oh, what are you waiting for to remove Balance Breaker? I is this some kind of joke? The brunette asked with a rather hesitant smile on his face, while a cold sweat began to adorn his face. Penemu could only raise her eyebrow further at the question. Do I have the face to make jokes? Oh of course not, the brunette commented with great nervousness. Issei took a deep breath, psyching himself up for what was going to happen. The brunette raised both fists, so that later the characteristic crimson glow covered him, only to fall face down when the weight of the robe made him feel that he weighed a thousand kilos more. Issei managed to slowly stand up, then blinked in complete shock after feeling how all his movements were extremely limited. Would I really have to do 800 reps with this? And better not even think about the 2000 repetitions with the Sword of Tiamat. You have an hour and a half to complete each exercise. If you don't, you move on to the next one. The Kadri commented, narrowing her eyes slightly. Understood. Issei nodded quickly. The last training you will do will be with Tannen. You will have to dodge or block all of his attacks for the next half hour, wearing the robe of course. Wait, will this be the last one? He exclaimed the brunette in complete disbelief. I'll barely be able to move from wear and tear. That's the idea. Penemu's solemn comment only caused a depressing aura to surround the brunette. If you manage to complete the training in the remaining 26 days, I will teach you a new trick of your sacred gear. Hearing this, Issei couldn't help but look up from him very curiously. But do I really have to do all that? The chestnut asked, still unable to believe it. Seeing this, Penemu felt a bit of empathy for her future lover. The first two weeks we expanded control over your sacred gear, and it was just that. Your strength only increased a little. Now, you need to perform deadly training on your body so that you are finally ready to receive the full power of Balance Breaker. I know which is crazy, but you can't expect to get much stronger from one month to the next using a simple and risk-free method, you know. Hearing this, Issei turned slightly serious. It would only be a month, and that is what I was looking for with this training, to become much stronger. You just can't waste such an opportunity. Very good. Issei stared at her, denoting a great fire in her eyes. Let's get started. Hearing this, Penemu was not the only one to smile, as Tiamat and Tannen shared her expression. The development of the training begins. Every three dots indicates a small time skip lapse. 128, 129, the brown-haired man gritted his teeth for each sit-up, keeping the count to perfection. In the distance, Penemu was watching him as he signed a couple of papers. Ellipsis. 220. 221. Issei was counting the number of repetitions as he could, while maintaining his balance so as not to fall, since he was upside down doing somewhat extreme push-ups. The sweat fell to the ground in an extreme way, looking like he wasn't going to last long without water. On this occasion, Tannen was watching him from the top of a tree, seeing that for the moment everything was going well. For now, ellipsis. 302. 303, the brunette was doing normal push-ups. Even so, his expression and the color of his face indicated that he was not far from reaching his limit. Tiamat was sitting next to him with a worried look on her face, hoping that nothing would happen to her lover. Ellipsis. 758, the scream escaped his throat, dropping the sword to the ground as he tried to catch his breath. He looked at his hands, realizing that they had started to bleed. Tannen looked at Penemu who showed him that she only had one phoenix tear left, so they should save it for a more critical moment. The dragon sweated slightly, but nodded, knowing he was right. Ellipsis. Issei had his gaze very absorbed in the light of the night, although his body that was trembling and his expression that was also in the same condition did not help to maintain that willpower that was expelled through his eyes. Basically, his body was at its limits, and now he had to face Tannen. He had already done it enough times since he started this part of the training. Therefore, he was already used to his movements. Another thing was that his body responded appropriately when he wanted to move. 
The brown-haired man watched as Tannen disappeared from his sight, then looked quickly behind him, seeing just in time how the dragon raised one of its fingers and then launched a small ball of magical power that was twice the size of a soccer ball. Anyone would have jumped back to dodge it, but since Issei could barely move, he could only lean his body back, causing the ball to miss him by a few inches. Tannen again moved from place to place at a terrible speed, attacking him again. Issei was forced to use his remaining strength to jump, and then spread his wings. He tried to stay airborne, but it only took a second for him to plummet to the ground, creating a huge crater. Not that he had fallen from a Tannen attack, he had been knocked over by his own weight. Ellipsis. 470, 471. Issei gritted his teeth as he did each repetition. This time, he was doing normal one-handed push-ups, indicating that he had already completed the 800 from the first challenge. Ellipsis. The battle against Tannen had the same result as always, but the dragon got a huge surprise when Issei didn't crash into the crater, and managed to rise into the air just in time to dodge his attack. Even so, the dragon was not carried away for the moment, and quickly attacked the chestnut tree through the air. Issei was even able to stay in the air, even though his entire body was shaking. The brown-haired man watched helplessly as the attack approached at great speed, dodging it by the hair, only being able to make a millimeter movement. Tannen's attacks started to become an intense flurry coming from everywhere causing Issei to move as he could. Like he was a person in a wheelchair playing a game of burns against ten experts. In one of the many balls, Issei couldn't help but widen his eyes in surprise, being hit squarely and sending him to the ground while spitting out a large amount of blood. Tannen hurried down to attend to him, as did Tiamat and Penemu. Ellipsis. A A A A G H H H H H. Issei yelled loudly as both of her hands trembled intensely. She was doing two handed push ups again, but this time there was Penemu sitting on her back, while she was wearing the ultra heavy robe. Finally, Issei's arms trembled even more intensely as he continued to scream, until they finally gave up, at the same time he vomited a large amount of blood. Ellipsis. 548, 549. This time, Issei was doing a pair of sit-ups while he was tied to a magic circle upside down, holding Tiamat's sword with both hands. Penemu was sitting behind him sitting comfortably in a chair while reading a book. The Kadri looked up for a second, seeing that every time Issei went down, his upper back was grazed by the tip of his katana, indicating that if he didn't support his own weight, he was going to end up impaled. For the same. Ellipsis. 1400. Issei's sword blows were slow, but constant. 1401. A completely absorbed look remained on her face, as she could see how her torso was in full view, as she had her robe open. 1402. For every movement of her hands, a large amount of beads of sweat shot out. Thanks to his bare chest, it could be seen how numerous bandages covered his torso, as well as his hands, and his forehead. Certain scars could also be seen, which were probably healed by Tiamat's healing ability, but it wasn't enough to remove the mark. On top of that, it could also be witnessed that his physique had started to grow even more these days. Even his lean muscles had been marked to such an extent that there was no longer an iota of fat, revealing a perfect torso, just like his arms and legs. Dot dot dot, 599, 600. The Brown exclaimed, she was once again doing the head push-ups, although this time Penemu was standing on her feet reading a book, making the weight she had to bear twice as much. Ellipsis. 771, 772. Issei was going at an amazingly fast pace as she clenched her teeth tightly. It was quite an amazing thing, since she was doing one-handed push-ups, and she had Penemu sitting on her back. Ellipsis. The brown-haired man was giving little cries every time he gave different thrusts at a decent pace, despite the fact that he was very close to finishing. Finally, Issei lowered his sword and began to breathe heavily as a large amount of sweat fell down his face. Her eyes flashed brightly, causing her to let out a loud cry. Tiamat couldn't help but look at him with slight surprise, since the speed of each sword strike had increased a lot, making even a normal person unable to clearly distinguish the movements. Ellipsis. 788. 789. Issei's calm gaze made a perfect contrast to the pace he was carrying, since he was going at a good speed. Meanwhile, Penemu was looking at him in slight surprise, as he was doing one-armed push-ups on his head, 
having her standing at her feet, and it didn't seem to affect him too much. Ellipsis. 798. Issei yelled loudly from the deadly crunches he was doing. 799. He yelled again with a lot of effort, and when he tried to climb up again, his body trembled intensely and he fell onto the katana. Penemu was up practically instantly when she saw the katana slice through her clavicle without issue, even going right through her body in the process. Such pain would be unbearable for anyone, but Issei wasn't just anyone. Penemu couldn't help but blink in complete shock when she saw how Issei even tried to get up. 8. 8. Issei gritted his teeth and used all his remaining strength. 800. He screamed at the top of his lungs, just in time for Penemu to withdraw the katana and trap him in his arms. Ellipsis. Issei watched in horror as a ball of magic headed straight for him. He had already completed all the series and their respective repetitions, but one of them had recently left a deep damage on his clavicle that Tiamat could not fully heal. He only needed this test to finish, and he was not going to let the opportunity pass him so easily. She could barely move, but it was nearly 30 minutes now, and she wasn't going to let that foolish injury take away her chance. Issei raised both of his hands towards the attack, stopping it in its tracks. Tannen couldn't help but blink in surprise at what he witnessed. Issei's arms trembled as he tried to block the attack. The brunette couldn't help but grit his teeth when he felt the sting of his clavicle, making his bandages begin to bleed. He took a couple of steps back, for what seemed like the end. Finally, the brown-haired man blinked with great decision and widened his eyes as much as he could. Ah, Issei gave a great shout at the same time that he began to advance against the attack causing a huge glow to rise into the air, at the same time that a small explosion could be glimpsed in the demonic forest. The dust slowly dissipated, leaving a staggering figure in place. All of Issei's injuries became visible, but that didn't seem to matter to him right now. The only thing that mattered to him was the sound of the clock, indicating that the ordeal was finally over. After 25 long days, I had finally made it. Issei's legs trembled and he gave up at the soothing sound causing him to fall onto his back with a thud. Issei felt how consciousness began to leave his body, but he saw just in time how a figure settled in front of him, looking down at him. Is that all you can do Issei? Tanin asked, revealing that she had finally recognized him. Issei couldn't help but be immensely surprised, so he quickly met her expectations. The chestnut man rose forcibly from the ground while holding his clavicle and trembling intensely. But the most important thing is that he had stood up, indicating to the dragon that there was still much more to observe. End of chapter. Chapter 26. A time with them. Issei started to see everything very blurry. The pain and exhaustion were killing him at the moment. Training to the death for so many days was quite a traumatic experience for him, even for someone of his caliber who liked to train a lot. He just hoped he wouldn't have to go through a similar ordeal in a long time. Issei could feel his consciousness fading, but he was able to continue standing as Penemu leaned into his back, holding him upright. He could hear the cadre mentioning certain ill-tempered words towards Tannen that were inaudible to him. All he knew was that the dragon laughed loudly for some reason. Knowing Tannen, she was surely berating him. Finally, he could see how a small bottle was brought to his lips, drinking that substance that had a strange taste. As if it were a somewhat salty raindrop. Almost at the second, Issei recovered all his senses and widened his eyes as he couldn't, after feeling how his energy and his wounds healed completely. What was? Issei instantly turned around, blushing slightly when he saw that Penemu was centimeters from her face. The cadre merely gave a small smile, as she held up the vial that contained the phoenix tear earlier. I thought you'd run out of it, the brown-haired man thought aloud, blinking several times. I saved one for when this time came. Penemu commented, moving even closer and making Issei slightly nervous. I knew that the damage would increase exponentially in the last stretch. That's why I wanted to make sure that you healed instantly after finishing the training. Issei blinked several times again. Finish it. The brunette slightly widened her eyes, beginning to assimilate that it was all over. Does that mean, did I make it? You did. Penemu answered placidly, to then enclose him in a tender hug that surprised the brown-haired man. Congratulations. Issei could only shake internally as he remembered the hell he had been through all month. It had been a complete nightmare, and the fact that he never gave up and kept going until finally completing it, 
brought emotions to the surface, which intensified when he was embraced by the beautiful Kadri. Issei slowly answered the hug, while he felt how tears threatened to well up in his eyes. Thank you so much. The brown thanked, hugging her tightly. This caused an inevitable smile to appear on Penemu's face after feeling how Issei conveyed her happiness to her. To be honest, I never thought you would make it through the training. Tannen commented, making them both look at him. Damn it. You even completed it a day earlier than estimated. The dragon leaned against a tree, breaking into a big smile. I'm proud of you, brat. I think you still have no idea how difficult it was to complete this training at such a low level. Tannen couldn't help but narrow her eyes at him with a mysterious look. You have quite an interesting bearer, Diedrake. I know the tour would be very interesting from the moment we made that promise. The dragon commented from the gauntlet, causing Penemu and Issei to separate. Even so, you always manage to break my expectations. Not only through your strength and mentality, but also through your heart. Diedrake's voice sounded very proud. I have never felt so comfortable with a carrier, and that is due to your personality. Diedrake. Issei couldn't help but be amazed by the words of his partner, and also one of his best friends. You are absolutely right. Tannen nodded, then gave him a smile. You've even accomplished the impossible. You managed to get close to the Ice Queen and melt her with your words. You were also able to gain a strong unconditional friendship with a cadre who didn't allow anyone to get close to her since her tragedy. Finally, the dragon closed its eyes with a small sneer. You are a very good person, Issei. Hearing this, Penemu couldn't help but get slightly serious. He's right, but don't let. I won't let that kindness blind me. The chestnut commented, making the cadre visibly relieved. Tiamat had already told me about this before. After my fight against Kokobiel, I know how to tell the difference between the people who deserve a second chance, and the ones who don't. He commented, unable to help but slightly clench his fist after remembering everything that happened. I'm quite relieved that you know that, the cadre commented, before looking at him very seriously. But also remember that those people won't always try to be the main feature. The cadre narrowed her eyes slightly causing Issei to look at her intently. The most troublesome are always the ones that move in the shadows. Meanwhile, at Kuo Academy, a well-known figure opened the bars of the academy in the dark, entering the compliment while giving a little sigh. They make me go at this time of night, Tiamat thought, having a small flashback. Sorry to bother you, but I need you to take a box to the occult club. Azazel's voice echoed through a small magic circle. I'm too busy to go and I don't feel like bothering Sirzex with these things. They're the guy's materials that will be used next week. Tiamat observed the enormous amount of furniture that was outside the enormous reconstructed building, indicating that only a few final preparations were missing to enable the classes again. The dragon headed straight for the occult club, giving a small yawn as she entered the premises. She couldn't help but look at the place with some curiosity, since she had never seen the place where Issei and the others usually met before. She wandered around the facility for a bit, until she finally came across something strange. Is that door sealed? The dragon wondered, unable to help but narrow her eyes with great suspicion. Tiamat set the box aside, and approached slowly, resting her hand on the various chains and ribbons, not to mention the magic circles that contained the room, both within and without. Tiamat could not help but blink in slight astonishment as she felt a fiber of energy from the other side although it was something very unusual. How strange. The power that is felt in here is quite recognized. But, at the same time, it is very different. She couldn't help but think, and then she was distracted by hearing how a book that was sticking out of the box fell to the ground. Tiamat couldn't help but widen her eyes in shock when she saw what it was, and quickly went to take it. She carefully fixed her gaze on the first page, denoting that it was not a simple book, it was an album. A photo album. An Issei photo album. Tiamat couldn't help but smile sweetly as she scrolled through each photo, watching Issei slowly grow. Each photo was taken in a different year. His growing smile disappeared when he realized that the photos were too few, and ever since the photo he had with the girl who looked like a boy, he had stopped smiling. Tiamat turned to the next page, seeing that the pages were blank. There were only 11 photos, each representing a birthday so it was definitely a bit strange that he didn't have at least five more photos. 
For obvious reasons, this made Tiamat angry, since it was very obvious that he seemed to have spent a rather lonely life, where not even his parents had accompanied him. Before she closed the album, she witnessed how the thickness on the next page was different. She didn't hesitate for a second to turn the page, only to be surprised. A rather pleasant surprise. My 14 years. Many thanks friends. Under the photo, she had written those words, where you could see how Issei was sharing a barbecue in the park well known to her. Two people close to his age accompanied him, hugging him tightly around the neck while holding a huge toothy smile on his face. At first she couldn't tell them apart, but as she went through photo by photo, year by year, she was able to quickly begin to recognize them. Finally, she came to the conclusion in the last photo, where she could see how the chestnut celebrated her 17th birthday, again with another barbecue, as usual. And of course, those two men were there again. Thank you very much, Matsuda and Motohama. It's those two. Tiamat couldn't help but think in slight astonishment. He now he could understand why Issei always spoke so highly of the two of them when he had the chance. After all, they had been the only ones who had been in the most important moments of his life, at a certain point. Tiamat turned the page, resting her hand on the empty spot seriously, then flashing a rather loving little smile. Solo Espera. The next day, Penemu was doing paperwork as usual. The wooden table was already somewhat deteriorated from being in the forest for a month and a half, but that was not very relevant, since the time there was about to end. Good morning. She exclaimed the chestnut with a big yawn, receiving a strange look from the cadre. Good morning. Why are you still wearing your robe? He asked himself, making Issei look at himself. It is no longer necessary. He commented with a sweet voice, and Issei couldn't help but smile at him. You're right. Issei took off his black robe, leaving it on the ground, making everything shake a little. The brunette looked at himself in great astonishment, moving his arms and legs. Amazing. I feel like he's floating. It is natural. Penemu explained, signing one last piece of paper before getting up from her seat. Your body weight has dropped exponentially. Now your body is much stronger than it was a month ago. On top of that, your armor control not only helped you with that, but also, by constantly pushing your magic limits, it has increased to be able to adapt these days. My magical reserves have increased. The chestnut wondered with great happiness. How much have they done? Considering that your magical reserves are almost low, and that you've been over-demanding them for more than two weeks, Penemu put her hand to her chin, thinking carefully. I think they're twice as big now. She finally found the answer, making Issei's eyes widen greatly. The double, he yelled, completely incredulous. It's not as much as it seems. She commented quickly, causing Issei to visibly deflate. Remember that your magical reserves are ridiculously low. Now, we could say that they are quite low. Penemu held up a finger. He's only gone up one level. I see. The brown-haired commented, as he felt a depressive aura begin to surround him. It's not for you to be disappointed. Penemu commented quickly, outlining a small smile. With all the progress you've made now, I'm sure you'll be able to keep the armor on for a long time. Remember that the boosted gear takes care of boosting your powers. Therefore, your magic will double what it did before with each boost. Penemu moved closer to him, placing a hand on her shoulder. Besides, that's just one goal we accomplished in our training. With your body in the condition it's currently in, Penemu would narrow her eyes with an air of cunning around her. How many boosts do you think you could do with your balance breaker active? This made Issei's eyes shine with great intensity. Now that we both have free time, I would like to teach you that skill I mentioned earlier. Penemu clarified, receiving all the attention from Issei. First, we must go to a desolate place. They both walked through the forest for a few minutes, arriving at a large open field, where the grass shone with great intensity, and you could see the huge mountain where Tiamat usually watched Issei's training. How many memories? The brown-haired man thought, remembering that this is the place where he had been tested by Penemu. You know about the transfer ability, right? Penemu perched next to her, taking in the scenery as her long hair fluttered freely in the breeze. Diedrake explained it to me, although I've never used it before, the brunette commented, rubbing his hair. Very good. Penemu nodded, then looked at him seriously. That skill is known for empowering allies. But certainly, 
the potential of that skill is far from ending there. Hearing that, Issei looked at her with great interest. You can also empower items, or even other items. Items. Issei couldn't help but ask, unable to keep up. Create a dragon shot. Issei instantly complied, materializing his gauntlet and implementing various boosts. Issei created an average-sized dragon shot at her level, then proceeded to look at her. Now, transfer all augments to attack. Hearing this, the brown-haired man couldn't help blinking in great surprise. Transfer. That surprise only increased further when the puny ball grew to an impressive size, being as big as the chestnut tree. Issei couldn't help but feel harassed by the great pressure exerted by the attack. He felt that soon it would be impossible for him to control it. Now expel it, Penemu ordered, holding onto Issei's back so he wouldn't go flying when he released the attack. The attack shot out like a huge crimson bolt, which traveled at a speed far greater than what he was used to. The attack devastated everything in its path, hitting the mountain and completely disintegrating it, leaving no trace of it. The brunette could only watch in complete shock as a huge path of destruction rose through the place, while the attack seemed to go on and on, without end. Finally, the brunette had to cover his eyes when an enormous crimson glow dazzled in the distance, creating a great explosive wave that reached where they were, creating a great blizzard that if it hadn't been for Penemu, would have gone flying almost instantly. As soon as the wave disappeared, the brown-haired man observed all the destruction with great astonishment, which only turned into enormous exhaustion from one second to the next. What's happening to me? She asked herself, causing Penemu to hug him more firmly. Once the augments come off your body, let's say your stats go back to normal. Penemu explained. This type of attack is very powerful, but it's also very draining. In a battle, this attack should be your last card, because once you use it, there won't be a second one. At least, there won't be a second one, until you get past yourself again. How will I know when that time comes? The brunette asked, receiving a small smile from Penemu due to his curiosity. It's still too early. You've improved a lot, but you're still not able to use Balance Breaker's full potential. Penemu rested his chin on the chestnut's head, closing her eyes calmly. Perhaps when you can break those limits, you will only be able to control such power. Break the limits. The chestnut wondered, and then stared at her. What do you mean with that? Not everything ends with Balance Breaker. But unfortunately, I won't be able to help you with that. Each carrier evolves differently depending on the carrier's characteristics. It's something you'll have to find on your own. She commented the cadre, pulling away from her chestnut as she put a finger to her head. You'll have to use your mind. Hearing this, Issei couldn't help but remember Penemu's three teachings. Mind, heart and body. But, in all this, there was something strange. When do we train my mind? Asked the chestnut. At first, Penemu was a little shocked by his question, but she quickly answered with a smile. Do you want to play another game of chess? She slyly asked, making Issei's mind light up at the answer. Their talk was interrupted, when a light blue appeared in the place, followed by a tackle to Issei through a big hug. The long light blue hair was the most obvious clue of who it was. Congratulations. Tiamat congratulated him, hugging him tighter as he rubbed his cheek against Issei's lovingly. Thank you so much. A cute smile appeared on the chestnut's face corresponding to the dragon's hug. Issei couldn't help but laugh at the dragon's warm attitude, although that moment was interrupted when a call came through. The brown-haired man got up from the ground, slightly surprised to have received a call. When he saw the contact, a small smile appeared on his face. Hello, Motohama. He answered quickly, causing both women to stare at him. Are you with Matsuda? Happy birthday. A huge torrent of wind shot out of the cell causing Issei to turn his face away a bit as he rolled his eyes. Hearing this, both women couldn't help but be visibly surprised. Hey, we know you're far away. Motohama's voice was the first to be heard, but it was heard as he was pushed by Matsuda. But we plan to have a barbecue when you come back to celebrate. They both tuned into the cell phone. How about? They asked at the same time. A small smile appeared on the brunette's face. Sounds great. See you tomorrow. Issei cut the call, to then stretch his body as if he were a cat. I'll go take a bath. He declared with a small yawn, heading towards the creek. Without her noticing, Penemu and Tiamat shared glances for a brief second, before nodding. 
Obviously. They were planning something. Later that same day, Issei gave a big pleasurable sigh, as he sat down in the middle of the stream. Nothing better than staying in the water for a while after a bath. He exclaimed the brunette with a huge smile between his teeth. He was wearing nothing but his underwear, completely relaxing in the water. That smile on his face disappeared almost immediately, after remembering the congratulations from his friends. 18 years old, huh? She thought to herself, looking up at the purple sky of hell. His deep thoughts were broken when he looked at his reflection in the water, surprised to see how his muscles had changed. Now, they were all almost equally thin but they were perfectly marked, seeing that there was not a hint of fat left on their bodies. I hadn't noticed before, but, the brown-haired man squeezed her arm lightly, making her muscles stand out even more. They have changed a lot in this month. Issei couldn't help but smile a little, seeing that the work had paid off more than he thought. I don't think they can grow bigger due to my physical build. But still, it's amazing. He concluded, smiling slightly at what he was seeing. The self-display ended when he heard a splash behind him, followed by four arms that slowly slid across his chest, enclosing him in a tight hug. Soon, a small blush appeared on her face when she felt how soft and spongy surfaces rested along her entire back. The blush only increased when she felt how a pair of lips took both of her cheeks, giving her a beautiful kiss full of affection. Happy birthday. Tiamat and Penemu rested their faces on the chestnut's shoulders, while a light blue and violet magic circle appeared in front of him, revealing a sheath for his katana with a brilliant design. Seeing this, Issei's blush quickly dissipated, and he picked up the scabbard with little stars in his eyes. Wow. This is great. He exclaimed the chestnut quickly turning around and hugging them with great strength, where they didn't take a second to respond with the same affection. Thank you so much. There is nothing to be thankful for. They both spoke at the same time again, unable to avoid blushing slightly, feeling Issei's skin so firmly. Still, that didn't stop them from smiling. I'll go holster it quickly. He exclaimed the brown-haired man with great happiness, running off to where he had left his clothes. Seriously, they're the best. Both women stared at Issei for a couple of seconds, while their blushes slowly increased. Her smile disappeared, adorning a rather serious face, while her gaze seemed to wander over the brown-haired body. Her body completely toned. The seconds continued to pass, until Tiamat decided to speak. I'm getting more and more anxious for him to break me in the middle, the rather vulgar comment left his lips, making Penemu nod. Me too, the Kadri answered without being able to deny it causing the blush to intensify a little more on her face. Issei placed the katana in the sheath with a big smile, as he admired the design of it. The women approached, sitting on the chestnut's sides. There is something that seems strange to me. Penemu commented, watching the passing of the clouds. If you're in your second year of high school and you're 18, does that mean you failed a year? Issei couldn't help but wince a little at the memories. You don't have to tell if you don't want to. He quickly commented seeing that Issei seemed quite annoyed. No. In fact, I'd like to talk about it. Especially, with the two of you. Issei rubbed his hair with a slightly wan smile, remembering his past. When I was little, my parents only took pictures with me on my birthdays. They were with me for the first four. Even so, they never spent time with me for anything else, especially as I got older. Finally, my fifth birthday came around, and it was my first birthday alone. After those dates, I started to cook myself, as my parents cared less and less about what I did. Not that they cared at first though. Issei looked up, giving a small sigh after remembering what happened on his sixth birthday. When I turned six, I found out in a discussion between my parents that they wanted to put me up for adoption. They had always wanted a girl, and that's why they disowned me like this. I think that as the years went by and they didn't have the possibility of even having another child, it made the disownment grow more and more. My sixth birthday was luckily not so bad, since I was a pretty lonely child anyway, and I didn't quite understand what they really meant by adoption. My seventh birthday was another to spend alone, and somehow, I felt that loneliness was beginning to affect me. Luckily, when I entered third grade, I met a transfer child and we became very good friends. Issei smiled slightly upon feeling the comforting touch of both women, indicating that they supported him at all times. She transferred before she was nine. And from then on, 
it's where the darkest time of my life begins, a slightly hurt look graced his face. Having come out of loneliness, you don't want to get into it anymore. Unfortunately, I was too shy and never made any more friends. The years went by, and being completely alone, I began to see celebrating my birthdays completely ridiculous, since they only reminded me of how lonely I was. When I was 12 years old, I started to have a slight interest in women. A childish interest, mere curiosity. Without the supervision of my parents, you can imagine the things I discovered on the internet. For that reason, I always tried to get girls to like me, and I never got anywhere. However, I never gave up. Let's just say I'd gotten a bit of a different kind of fun, she explained, then shook her head as she remembered what happened the next year. My parents enrolled me in a high school where there were no women. Obviously, my interest in going to school was zero for obvious reasons. Without having any kind of inspiration, and without having the vigilance that a parent should always have over you, I simply absented myself during the whole year, going to the parks and reading not very correct magazines. But, obviously they found out, since before the end of the year, they saw me in one of the parks. Even so, it was too late to make up for all the lost time. However, I never gave up. Let's just say I'd gotten a little different kind of fun, she explained, then shook her head after remembering what happened the next year. My parents enrolled me in a high school where there were no women. Obviously, my interest in going to school was zero for obvious reasons. Without having any kind of inspiration, and without having the vigilance that a parent should always have over you, I simply absented myself during the whole year, going to the parks and reading not very correct magazines. But, obviously they found out, since before the end of the year, they saw me in one of the parks. Even so, it was too late to make up for all the lost time. However, I never gave up. Let's just say I'd gotten a little different kind of fun, she explained, then shook her head after remembering what happened the next year. My parents enrolled me in a high school where there were no women. Obviously, my interest in going to school was zero for obvious reasons. Without having any kind of inspiration, and without having the vigilance that a parent should always have over you, I simply absented myself during the whole year, going to the parks and reading not very correct magazines. But, obviously they found out, since before the end of the year, they saw me in one of the parks. Even so, it was too late to make up for all the lost time, to then shake his head after remembering what happened the next year. My parents enrolled me in a high school where there were no women. Obviously, my interest in going to school was zero for obvious reasons. Without having any kind of inspiration, and without having the vigilance that a parent should always have on you, I just skipped the whole year, going to the parks and reading not very correct magazines. But, obviously they found out, since before the end of the year, they saw me in one of the parks. Still, it was too late to make up for all the lost time, to then shake his head after remembering what happened the next year. My parents enrolled me in a high school where there were no women. Obviously, my interest in going to school was zero for obvious reasons. Without having any kind of inspiration, and without having the vigilance that a parent should always have on you, I just skipped the whole year, going to the parks and reading not very correct magazines. But, obviously they found out, since before the end of the year, they saw me in one of the parks. Still, it was too late to make up for all the lost time. Without having any kind of inspiration, and without having the vigilance that a parent should always have over you, I simply absented myself during the whole year, going to the parks and reading not very correct magazines. But, obviously they found out, since before the end of the year, they saw me in one of the parks. Even so, it was too late to make up for all the lost time. Without having any kind of inspiration, and without having the vigilance that a parent should always have over you, I simply absented myself during the whole year, going to the parks. And reading not very correct magazines. But, obviously they found out, since before the end of the year, they saw me in one of the parks. Even so, it was too late to make up for all the lost time. A big smile graced the brunette's face. But, that mistake I made, allowed me to be in the same year as Matsuda and Motohama, and that's where we met. The three of us had the same interest in women, although clearly I was a bit more informed by my parents' neglect. After a very short time, 
we stopped talking solely about sex, and started meeting up with each other to play video games, or other things. Obviously, the topic of women always remained the main thing, but we never fully absolved ourselves for it. Issei waved his hand dismissively. This is how time went by. The great frustration of not even being able to have a girlfriend was overwhelming, but we were always together. We always supported each other. We simply became inseparable. Issei laughed again, after remembering a small anecdote. In fact, their parents were the ones who pressured mine to transfer all three of us to Kuo Academy. After reaching that part of the story, both women could feel how a dark aura surrounded the chestnut's body, at the same time that his smile slowly disappeared. The three of us went in with the idea of getting a girlfriend. We had even made a bet as to which of us would get a girlfriend first, Issei clenched her fists tightly. And she came. He felt how Penemu's hand lightly squeezed his shoulder. We already know that part of the story. You don't need to repeat it again. The woman commented quickly with a concerned tone, making Issei look at her with great appreciation. Thank you. The brown-haired man answered, positioning his hand above hers. Penemu just smiled at him, nodding her head. But, whenever I remember it, I think about it and come to a conclusion, it's okay that it was like that. Upon hearing the chestnut's words, both women looked at Issei with great surprise. After all, if Yuma, if Rainair had been something real, I would never have met Diedrake, I would never have met Tannen. Issei hugged them both tightly around the hips, drawing them close to him and making them blush from such a delicate touch. I would never have met you too. The brunette exclaimed with a smile between his teeth. You taught me that there are incredible women. That there are such nice women. That there are such empathetic and affectionate women. Issei slightly lowered his gaze from her, looking at both of them with great affection. You taught me that if there are irreplaceable women. Issei could only watch in confusion as Tiamat's and Penemu's eyes shone intensely, added to their flushed faces. In fact, they looked like they were about to cry. I said something wrong, the brown-haired man asked, feeling a little bad when he saw their faces. The answer came to him almost instantly, when both women pounced on him, knocking him to the ground in a big hug. The brown-haired man couldn't help but yell in surprise. Say something mean, are you serious? Penemu asked, tightening her hold on her even more. For us, you are also irreplaceable, Issei. Tiamat replied, giving him a kiss on the forehead. We are very glad that you feel the same. Issei could only chuckle, reinforcing his embrace on them even more. They are the best. By the way, tell me more about that boy who turned out to be a girl. Penemu commented, making Issei chuckle slightly as he remembered Irina. You can't imagine how I reacted when I found out that it really was a woman. Issei began to tell the story, making Penemu laugh slightly before the expressions that the brown-haired woman made to explain herself. It was just two women and a man having fun on the edge of a stream. It was not something very out of the ordinary. The problem comes when the ones having fun are the supposedly coldest and most dangerous women in the world. Issei didn't realize that he was very special, and what he generated in those two women every time they were near him. Probably, that innocence of hers was one of the many points that the Dragoness and the Kadri loved. Several hours later, the hours passed quickly where Issei narrated some somewhat funny stories that he spent with Matsuda and Motohama. He was not the only one to tell certain anecdotes, since Diedrag joined him, as did his other two companions, where they narrated certain stories from the past. You were all very nice, even funny. This was no time to tell sad stories, especially with the atmosphere that had been generated. They just all laughed together and shared the best experiences from their past together. It was nice to see that they all acted with great ease, denoting that the walls of the past between Diedrag and Tiamat were perhaps already slowly beginning to diminish, as well as demonstrating the great trust that had been built between the dragon and Penemu. Even so, the dragon always found a way to annoy Diedrag, something that seemed quite funny to Issei and Penemu, but not to Diedrag, for obvious reasons. Anyway, the dragon always took it pretty well. After so much talk, everyone fell asleep without even realizing it. The first to wake up was Issei, who instantly realized that it was already getting dark. How long did I fall asleep? He thought the chestnut, holding his head. His thoughts were dispelled when he saw that his companions were still sleeping next to him. Both breathed very calmly, denoting the great relief they felt at this time. It was a curious thing, 
if we consider that both of them were dreaming horrible nightmares every day. Every day, before Issei invaded their hearts without even realizing it. The brunette turned, looking closely at Tiamat's entire body. It wasn't because of his obscenity, he just felt. Strange, that was the word. The sensation that his body transmitted to her was very strange. He had always wanted to be surrounded by beautiful women with amazing bodies. And, if possible, that they be half naked or topless. And here they were, the two most beautiful women he had ever met, in nothing but their underwear. Well, Penemu used a towel to cover her breasts, but it was practically as if she were in her underwear. What are you thinking about so much, partner? Deidre's voice echoed through his mind, making the brunette sigh internally. On the promise, Issei explained in his thoughts, his tone seeming genuinely confused. There is no doubt that I was able to complete it, and that I can control myself now. But, Deidre insisted. But now I feel a different kind of attraction, the brunette thought, rubbing his hair as he fixed his gaze on Tiamat's face. And it only happens to me with the faces of the two of them. It's strange. Issei waved his hand hesitantly, in the direction of the sleeping dragon's face. I know very well that it's not something dirty. I just want to caress her face. Issei stopped her hand just before touching Tiamat's face, feeling how a discomfort began to take over her abdomen. For some reason, I feel like it's even worse than wanting to touch her body, it's so frustrating. Deidre couldn't help but smile internally, seeing how Issei was beginning, not to discover, but to accept those feelings that plunged him into misery a few months ago. Issei knew very well what he felt for them, another thing is that it is so hard for him to accept it because of his past. Would you die for me? Rainer's words echoed in her head again, causing her to frown. Why do I always have to remember that? He thought the chestnut with great impotence, while he held his stomach strongly with one hand, feeling how that discomfort had increased a lot just by remembering for a second the woman who had hurt him so much. Due to the impulse of that same impotence, or perhaps due to sheer unconsciousness, Issei ended up placing his hand on Tiamat's cheek, caressing it with an indescribable affection. The dragon opened her sleepy eyes, slightly surprised by what the brunette was doing. Seeing that Tiamat had found out, he felt like a child who had been caught doing a misdeed. I'm sorry, were Issei's simple words. He looked down from her, not having the strength to look at her face as he removed his hand from hers. Surprisingly to him, Tiamat placed her hand above his, preventing him from leaving her cheek, then reached out and hugged him tightly. Before Issei could ask, the dragon gave him a big and beautiful smile, indicating that she had really enjoyed that touch of affection, contrary to what she had thought. The surprises didn't end there, as Penemu joined them, hugging him tightly from behind as she nestled her face into the chestnut's neck with great tenderness. In addition to that, she took Issei's hand who was holding her abdomen tightly, intertwining it with hers in a rather sweet gesture. Issei couldn't help but feel a little overwhelmed by such a sudden situation, but he quickly reacted and couldn't help but make fun of himself. Why did you think so much about something so simple? It's just a simple touch. He thought the brunette, bumping her forehead against Tiamat's, making the dragon's smile grow even more as she closed her eyes with great happiness. The three of them were huddled together for a few seconds, until a call broke the harmonious sunset. Issei, do you hear me? Azazel's voice was heard through the small magic circle, making the brunette widen his eyes. I'm done with Rias and the others. We'll meet at the occult club for a vitally important meeting. Azazel turned around, looking at the small old building. See you in five minutes. He concluded, ending the call. The chief put both hands in his pockets, watching as a figure that gave a glorious image walked through the door. Ah, it's been a long time, Azazel. A rather relaxed and friendly voice rang out after the door opened, causing a huge mocking smile to appear on Azazel's face. Don't give me your corniness. Azazel waved his hand dismissively, then narrowed his eyes seriously. Michael. End of the first part.